Um, so hi, um, I'm Doran Miller. I'm really excited that you are all here with us this evening. Um, I'm really, really proud to be so involved with Jewish National Fund. Um, I'm the president of the Phoenix JNF Future Board, um, as well as a member of the Desert States Board of Directors and a member of the JNF Water Task Force. Um, there are really a ton of different kinds of ways to be involved with Jewish National Fund, depending on your passion and interests. And I know we're gonna touch on a lot of them tonight during our program, because I'm gonna bring them up. Um, so I guarantee there's work that JNF is doing in Israel that you'll be fascinated to learn more about. And as always, if something sparks your interest, I'd be so happy to talk to you more about it later. So you can always reach out to me. At some point, I'll drop my email in the chat so you'll have it. Um, and really feel free to email me if you have any questions or wanna talk about anything that you've heard about tonight. Um, well, I love being involved um, locally in Phoenix, as well as having say in JNF's work um, in water. Tonight, I am here because like you, I love wine. Um, who doesn't, <laughs> especially now? Um, most people really don't know how diverse and de uh, delicious the wine in Israel is. Um, and so that's why we invited Josh Greenstein, sorry, to speak to us um, and answer our questions and talk to us a little bit more about wine in Israel. Josh is a fifth generation wine expert with a career that has spanned you know, all aspects of the wine industry. Um, he's now the executive vice president of the Israel Wine Producers of America. And um, in that role, Josh acts as the voice of the Israeli wine industry here in America. So with that, Josh, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks guys. Um, thank you very much. And uh, you know, one of the only best way to save water is by drinking more wine, right? You know, we have two options, I would, I would drink wine. So, First of all, uh, good evening to everybody. My name is Joshua Greenstein. Um, if you don't have any wine in your glass or you didn't get the wine for the call or you don't have anything, just go grab a drink real quick. I'm just gonna give a quick introduction about myself, which is boring anyway. So go grab yourself a drink, anything, out of the fridge, something cool. Um, um, so my name is Joshua Greenstein. I live in Westchester, New York, um, and I represent a majority of the Israeli wines in the US. I have a pretty cool job. Um, usually I'm on the road traveling, running around, going from state to state, working with groups like you guys and doing, you know, these live events. And um, lately we found that this, uh, I go like this, this little camera right there is helping us all right now. It's doing that cool thing. It's that thing that we used to put that piece of tape over so no one would see what's going on. It's now opened up us all to our lives and is, and is helping us. Um, and in this case, we're drinking some great wine. Um, so tonight we're going to be drinking four different wines from Israel. Um, one of the jokes I make, I say Israel's been making wine for about 5,000 years. Uh, they just got good at it, all right? It took a long time of learning and understanding and, and figuring out how to uh, work the land. And they've gotten to the point now where they're, they're working the land and they're getting 90 points, 95 points, Robert Parker, wine enthusiast, spectator. And they've grown to a point now where they can be represented and sold all over the country as Israeli wines. And that's the most important thing about these wines is the fact of where they're from. You know, when you go visit a winery in California or Italy or France and you, you hear these beautiful stories about the wineries, it's, a, it's the stories that get you. The wine is good. There's, there's really no such thing as a bad wine. Wines are good, but it's the story that brings you in, the people that you're enjoying it with and the, the, the winemaker's cool story about his brother that made him make wine and that got you, you know, and now you're, you're sitting here drinking it. So uh, let's get to the first glass of wine that we're going to be drinking tonight. Um, I got four different wineries here, four different grapes, four different everything. We tried to spread it out for you guys. Um, and all these wines pair well with next week's uh, Thanksgiving holiday that's coming up also. So um, the first one is a Gewürztraminer. Gewürztraminer is a fun grape to drink because uh, it's not a Chardonnay. It's not a Sauvignon Blanc. It's not that typical white wine that you're going after. It's just something fun and unique. Um, it's been around for a long time and it really pairs well with Thanksgiving. Um, why does it pair well? Because it's, it's, it's a semi wine. It's not sweet over the top. Uh, we were talking about it before. What did you say? It wasn't like having a piece of candy. No, it's, it's not like a, a, like a piece of candy, Stephanie. It's, it's kind of like that. It's that in between. It's that just sweet enough taste that gives you, you know, that, 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 that enjoyable sensation in your mouth where, where it feels good to drink it. Um, and this wine should be served chilled. Um, in between glasses, it's something you maybe want to put back in the fridge and keep it nice and cold um, while you're drinking it or put it on ice. Um, a little bit about the winery, Gushet Zion is located um, in the Judean Hills, um, southern, southern Judean Hills. And uh, Doran, what do we have going on in the Judean Hills with JNF? Anything yeah, cool going so on over there? 
I'm really glad you asked actually, because we, JNF has a really important project in that region. Um, so the JNF through um, partnership with, the, with some donors, they um, built the Gush Etzion Visitor Center. And just to backtrack a little bit, JNF actually has a really, really long history in that region because in like the late 1920s, early 1930s, JNF actually purchased that land um, that ultimately, you know, um, settlers lived there, you know, before Israel even became a state. Um, and it was actually also incredibly important during the War of Independence in 1948. So JNF partnered with, and you know, as with with all JNF projects in Israel, we always partner locally, whether it's with a, an organization, a regional council, with the national government. So in this case, JNF partnered with the Society for Preservation of Israel Heritage Sites to develop the at Zion Visitor Center um, as a memorial to the heroic men and women who gave their lives to protect the communities of the Etzion block during um, the War of Independence. And um, I'll also just say that, you know, prior to JNF coming in and helping to restore that visitor center, it was a formerly, it was a really, really rundown museum. Um, it's now been transformed into like a beautiful, modern, interactive visitor center to really preserve that story um, of Gush Etzion and the people who, you know, sacrificed their lives for Israel's future. Um, and I will say even just you know, beyond the Gush Etzion Visitor Center, um, with respect to our partnership with the Society for the Preservation of Israel Heritage Sites, um, they work around the country and have preserved more than 150 heritage sites around Israel that are now open to the public, that help tell the story of, you know, the Jewish people and the land of Israel. And they're all really, really a powerful symbol of Jewish independence and of our shared history. And that one in particular is really touching and really moving. And um, so I'm so glad that you chose a wine from that region because it gave me a chance to talk about that project. It, it, it's such a fun, it's a fun winery to visit also because, you know, uh, tourism is big for the winery and wine industry these days also. So when it's time and the, everything opens up and we're back on the road and we're not virtually touring, uh, Gush actually has a great restaurant there also, a great dairy restaurant at the, at the facility too. Uh, great halloumi burger, okay? Yum. So I had a great halloumi burger there. Um, it's just a beautiful place to visit, uh, you know, not too far from Jerusalem, easy to get to. Uh, and the, the winery is family run, family owned. All the wine is coming out of that region and the grapes are coming out too. You know, Dwayne, what just popped in my head is an interesting idea. You know, you, you're gonna mention a couple places for people to go visit uh, from the JNF world. I think that when you, next time you go, you know, you go on your phone, you say, what's the closest coffee to me? Where, I, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I wanna find it. I think should, when you go to these places, you should find the closest winery and have to go there before you go visit the historical site. You have a couple of drinks, you do what you got to do, you get on the bus and then we go. So that might be an interesting tour we can run by Russell is like wine stop, historical site. Wine I stop. Love it. I don't think we'd have to twist too many arms. I think it's um, a great idea. Can I ask a question about this wine? Sure. So you mentioned that it's sweet, but it's not too sweet. It's kind of easy on everybody's palate. What makes a wine super sweet or more mild? Like what influences the, I guess, sweetness level of a wine? Uh, it's going to be the grapes primarily is going to be what's controlling that. And, you know, when there's going to be certain, you know, the, the fastest growing grape right now actually is a Moscato. Um, I don't know if you guys like Moscato. Moscato is a, it's it's a, so, it's sweet, a right? so sweet, but right now it's in the, the trend of wines, sweet wines are actually coming back uh, and, and sweet reds are actually coming back. I, personally, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of sweet wines myself. Nope. Uh, <laughs> but it is a, it, it's a, you know, maybe the consumer that was drinking beer, or was going to the bar and having like a vodka cranberry juice, that sweet drink is now transitioning into wine and this is their foot in the door. So welcome to the wine world and hopefully they find some cool wine soon. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll move along and we'll, we'll try something interesting here. Um, and I mentioned before, you know, the first wine wasn't a Chardonnay, it wasn't Sauvignon Blanc, but the next one is, okay? The next one is a Chardonnay. Um, but what makes this Chardonnay so different and unique than all the other ones? Uh, first of all, the winery is it's Seagal Winery. Uh, and a quick story about Seagal Winery. Um, there's a thing called being a master of wine. Uh, master of wine, there's about 300 and something of them in the world, okay? Uh, and these guys know a lot more than me about wine. They can talk wine, they know wine, they sniff wine, they, they, they can do everything. Uh, Edo Levinson, the winemaker for this winery, just became the second master of wine in all of Israel. And the all, th this fact that I'm about to say is amazing. So. Seagal also owns Barkan Winery, um, and they produce wines from $10 all the way up. This wine would retail for, you know, under 25, but 
Ito, the winemaker at Sigal and Barkan, is the only winemaker in the world. I'm going to say it again. He's the only winemaker in the world that's producing a wine that's under $12 or $15 a bottle that is a master of wine. And he's in Israel, of all places. So it's just really cool. And when you become a master of wine, you want to try really weird stuff. You want to do cool things. Uh, the, the, the CEO of the company usually gives you a little more leeway, gives you a couple extra shekels to go spend some money on new equipment and do some cool stuff. Um, and in the wine world, that's what we all want to try. We all want to try new stuff. Um, so I don't know if any of you have ever had a wild fermented wine before um, or know what a wild fermented wine is. Um, so in the fermenting process, uh, you use yeasts, you know, you import yeast, you use yeast, yeast can come in like a little block like this from wherever all different kinds of yeast that winemakers find work best with what they're ever trying to do with the wine. Uh, and in this situation, Ido said, let's get wild. Let's use the natural yeast of the grape. Um, and we were talking before, uh, before some people got to talk about vegan and we were talking about organic and we we're talking about all these kind of cool things. And something that I won't mention during this call is the K word. Um, but what the K word does is allows all these, which is kosher, um, and all these wines are, uh, but what's cool is, you know, this winemaker being able to go out and do all these cool things. He's just, he's embracing what was put in front of him. He's embracing the wild yeast. And the challenge behind that, by the way, is if it messes up a tiny, tiny, you know, with yeast, it, when you go and buy it at the store, you know what you're getting. This is this much, this is how much it's gonna work. But when you do it like this, if it doesn't work, the wine is not good. Um, but this one is beautiful. Well, Josh, you said you weren't gonna talk about it, but I actually do have a question, which is, what makes wine kosher? I mean, I think when it comes to meat, we all have sort of an understanding of what makes meat kosher versus not kosher. But when it comes to wine, what makes it kosher? And is all of the wine that is produced in Israel like de facto kosher wine also? Great, great questions, great questions. And the, to, I'll answer the second one first. So what's going on in Israel right now, the growth of wineries is on fire. Like there's over 350 plus wineries in Israel today. The interesting fact is the majority of them are not kosher, okay? But total production of wines coming out of Israel is 95% of it's kosher. There's just so many of these small little garage yeastas popping up. Like if you guys are in the beer, if you guys like good beer, you know, all these little breweries are popping up every corner, every little brewery is popping up anywhere it is. So it's interesting that, you know, these guys are popping up all over the place and most of them are not kosher. And eventually when they really want to be, become kosher, that's when they become bigger. Okay, so what does kosher mean? Uh, 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 most people, when I ask that question, they say the wine is blessed, right? The wine is holy. And it's actually the big, biggest misconception. Uh, a wine being kosher, all it means is, I usually stand up and put my hands behind my back and I say, all it means is that the person observed that no one was doing anything bad or touching it. It's observation. That's all it is. The person observing it, those names on the back of the Snapple, the Ritz crackers, the whatever you're eating, the wine, uh, observe the process to make sure nothing was done differently. Nothing was done bad. Nothing was put into it. There was no this, there's no that, there's no. So as far as the process of making wine, this is the same as Yellowtail or Kendall Jackson, just with the supervision. Oh, thank you. That I've always wondered. It's, it's, so it's, it's cool because, you know, it, it, it gets pigeonholed a lot of the times. I also make the joke. I say, how many people have a 92 point Robert Parker wine on the bottom shelf next to the bathroom? between sakis and ports. I say, all my Israeli wines are usually there. Dorn, you live in Arizona, so it's not a big state where you have a ton of kosher stores or Jewish stores. Your, my wines are in any store you go to is where I'm talking about. Um, and I, I'll mention it now, I usually mention it at the end, but people always say, you know, what can we do to help Israel? How can we promote Israel more? What can we do? Um, wherever you live, whatever restaurant you're delivering from these days or calling up and having them order from, ask them if they have Israeli wine, okay? And for the most part, they're going to say no, which is okay. I'm okay with it. Doran's okay with it. We're all all right with it. Why? Because it'll be in their mind and they'll think about it. And next time they place an order or they call the company or someone walks in or they're doing a promotion, they'll know that Israel even produces wine. Um, so it's, it's just a thing. It's a, it's a good deed for us all to go do. And we're, you know, we're all trying to do little things these days. So if you can just request Israeli wine or you need giving gifts for the holidays this year, you're walking into someone's house for Thanksgiving or you're sending wine to your parents because you're not going to their house for Thanksgiving, send them a bottle of Gewurz Commuter, send them a bottle of something. Well, I have a great follow-up question for that, which is that, you know, we obviously, a lot of us got the pack 
um, that you set up for us. If we want to buy more, if we want to buy more wine from Israel, and you know, we do live in maybe a place like Phoenix, and we maybe don't have access to it, what is the best resource for us to order more wine from Israel if we want more? Great question. So there's there's many companies out there. Uh, we, we've gotten heavily, uh, are you sure you have a Total Wine by you? We sure um, do. For those of you who ever heard of Total Wine, Total Wine is now a like multi uh, $10 billion retail store. It's huge. Um, and Dorna, I bet you next time you walk into a Total Wine in Arizona, look, they have two four foot sections. The top one says kosher and then next to it, it says Israel. So David Trone is the owner of Total Wine and Spirits and he's close with uh, the Herzog family that I import all the wines for me. Um, and the guy just has a special place in his heart for Israel and became close with the, the Herzog and is now put it to his place to try to sell these wines as simply Israeli. And it's huge for us to be able to see that we're getting out of that box in a big retail chain like that. Wines.com. Uh, and then there's a lot of kosher websites like kosherwine.com is the largest one, J Wines, and they carry pretty much everything. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so we'll get into some reds um, so we can hear a little more about some wines uh, as we're going. The next winery is going to be Tulip Winery. And uh, it's a Merlot, guys. All right. Let's not be scared of it because it says Merlot on it. Let's not open it first because we want to get rid of it because it's the Merlot of the group. It's, it's, it's okay to have the, um, the Merlot. The Merlot is a fun wine grape. Uh, if you think of some of the most expensive wines in the world that are coming out of France, they're Merlots. Okay. Literally the most expensive wines in the world. Most of them are Merlots. I am not a Merlot drinker at all. And I opened it tonight because it was like, well, whatever. If I don't finish the bottle, it's Merlot. So I don't care. And it's really good. Like it's, it's really good. I'm really enjoying it. The bottle is three quarters of the way gone at this point. So. And, and listen, Merlot is fun. It's jammy as a grape. It's easy. It's, it's you know, it, it goes perfect again with like the cranberry sauce, the stuffing or what, or the, what else? We, we're not doing stuffing. Some of us, what are we doing, Doran? Skillet cornbread. There we go. So if you're not doing stuff in cornbread, this would go well with that as well. You maybe throw some cranberries in there or something like that. Um, but I love telling the story of Tulip. Um, you know, when we're all around the family this time of year and we're all sitting around the table and talking about wine, when you have nothing to talk about anymore in your family, by the way, just a side note that just came to my mind because it works. If you have nothing more to talk about with your family that you're been stuck with for however long, talk about the wine in front of you. I mean, talk to your husband or your wife about the wine in the glass in front of you. It's like a great topic of conversation. Um, so Tulip Winery is a kibbutz up in the north um, called Kavar Tikva, Village of Hope. Uh, it's a community for uh, special needs, uh, men and women uh, that aren't able to, autistic, uh, mentally challenged men and women that aren't able to live at home anymore. Um, and that came together into this community up in northern Israel, up until uh, about 45 minutes north of Tel Aviv. Um, and they live in this community together. Um, <clears throat> and it's one of my favorite places to visit. I can go to all the wineries all day long. I can see wineries all up in the day, but to go, Roy Yitzhaki is the owner, um, and to just go hang out with him and to hear the stories from these people and to, to talk to them and to see them working, to have a purpose. And uh, there, there's so many good stories there, but the one of them that I like to share the most was um, one of the gentlemen in the, the, that moved to the kibbutz was 30 something years old when he moved there and he was a mute. He didn't speak, he didn't talk. He just kept to himself and just, that's it. Um, and then when he moved to the community, he offered him a job at the winery. Uh, and I believe that was like 10, 15 years ago. And now the joke is he won't shut up. All right. This guy just needed to break out of his shell and have a purpose and have a place to go and get paid. He's got a girlfriend now. All the money that he works for, he spends it all on her. He goes to the store, he goes to the mall, he goes into town, he buys gifts. And the sense of purpose that that gives somebody to have a job and to wake up every morning and want to know that you're going to make something and do something, uh, it's cool. And it's a good feeling because most of us all have that every day. Imagine not having that, not having that sense of purpose to wake up and go do something and be able to buy uh, your own Skittles at the store because you want a piece of candy. You know, like it's pretty cool that these people have this job um, and this opportunity to be able to do stuff like this. Um, I'm really glad you told that story before we move on to the next one. I just feel like it's like a really good segue to talk about some of the work that JNF is doing um, with disabilities because it's a really important project area for JNF. Um, you know, 
the idea of building an inclusive society that look beyond, looks beyond a person's disability, giving everybody an opportunity to contribute and be a member of society according to that person's abilities is like a really fundamental tenet. You know, the idea of inclusivity is a, you know, it's a measure of our civilization and it's a really fundamental precept of Judaism. And JNF and affiliates in Israel are working to support and fully integrate people of varying levels of disabilities. And they're doing it in a whole array of projects. One of them is LOTEM, which is a amazing project. Um, the outdoors and parks and hiking are a really, really key aspect of Israeli society and culture there. And um, a lot of people with physical disabilities were limited in their ability to participate in the outdoors. And so LOTEM is a fully accessible park and outdoor experience. Um, there's a project called Special in Uniform, which enables um, Israelis with varying level, varying degrees of physical and mental disabilities to still en enlist in the IDF and serve their country like their friends and their families do in the same way. Um, the Red Mountain Therapeutic Writing Center in the South is a really, really amazing organization that um, gives uh, basically like therapeutic horseback riding for people with physical and mental disabilities. And of course, Ali Negev is um, an unbelievable project, a rehabilitation hospital in the South that not only um, you know provides inpatient care, outpatient care, um, opportunities for people with disabilities to work and contribute. Um, and so just this work with people with disabilities and the idea around and having an inclusive society and the story that you told um, really, I think also animates a lot of JNF's work in this area. Um, so it's a really beautiful thing. And I, you know, we did not plan this at all. Like Josh picked this wine without knowing um, necessarily, I mean, maybe you did already know about JNF's work with disabilities, but um, I just thought when I was looking at the wines that it would be a really great opportunity to also just mention the work that JNF is doing in this area. It, it, you know, and especially, you know, coming up on just the holiday season, I also like just telling the story just so everyone can get around the table. Like I said, like, I just like telling the stories behind wine. Anyone can talk about the wine and tell you the alcohol content and the, the sugar and all that stuff. I'm the storyteller. I think that's the, the, the cool part about these wines. That's what makes them all unique and interesting. Um, and two more things about Tulip. Uh, one of their taglines is you can label wine, but you can't label people, mm. which is just a, you know, just an amazing, uh, it's, it's, I have no magnets on my refrigerator downstairs, like nothing except for that one magnet, like in the little corner because they gave it to me. And I just think it's such a cool little statement to look at. Um, and if there's any basketball fans out there, uh, the NBA draft was yesterday, but Amari Stoudemire, uh, who played for Phoenix, he also played for the New York Mets, Knicks, and now he's the coach of the New York Net, now New York Mets. He makes a wine also in Israel, Stoudemire Wines. Uh, he makes it there with the friends of Tulip and he loves going to the community and helping them and working and doing a lot of fun projects with them. So, um, yeah, I know the story of Low Tom very well. I just, I just think also, you know, I love hearing cool, successful things of what's going on in these special needs communities, which is a very, very cool thing. Um, so we'll get to the, uh, one more wine. Uh, we're gonna be doing the uh, Oregonus Ambuka Cab. Uh, we left the, so the order that I taste everything in was what was lighter to fuller, okay? Uh, a little bit about wines in general before we get to that last wine. If you did open all four, Yes, you guys did it. You rock. Um, um, if you don't finish that, and if you finish them, even better. Have a great morning, I hope, tomorrow. Um, if you didn't finish them, I would take the cork and stick it back in the bottle. The white wines, you stick the cork right back in, upside down usually because it goes in much easier. Um, and you get probably another two days out of it in the fridge, okay? Uh, same thing with, with the white wines. With the red wines, whatever you don't finish, I would suggest you take the cork, put it in upside down also, and just store it for about two days uh, in a cool spot underneath. If you don't finish it after two days, in my opinion, it's pretty much, you can do some other stuff with it. But one cool other thing you can do with it, I'm sure many of you have kids or have fruit in the house, okay? So you know that strawberries or the pineapple that you didn't finish uh, yesterday or the week before and you're about to throw them away? Mix the wine with them, make some sangria, add a little brandy, and that will stay an extra two days also in the fridge. So. Uh, a little bit about Amuka Cab. Uh, so Cabernet is going to be a little bit fuller body, uh, a little bit richer, uh, a little bit more of the, the, the bigger, bolder wine of the bunch. Uh, but this is not the biggest Cabernet that you would ever taste. Uh, you know, we talked before, like, what makes the wine? The terroir, where this is being grown. So this is up in the north. This is up in the north in the Galilee. This is a, a fun Cabernet because it's, it, it's uh, because the way that it's, it's approachable. It's not that overwhelming one. Um, so I think that this, again, would go well with the Thanksgiving because people that want a Cabernet but want to be able to drink what they normally like, that grape, 
listen, cab is king at the end of the day. Uh, mo- eight out of 10 bottles probably being sold. There's probably a Cabernet or something like that. Uh, most people, when they hear of a grape, they just flock to it because they like it, because they trust it. Uh, advice, branch out of it. Try something different. Try a blend. Try a grape you've never heard of before. Uh, see where it takes you. Uh, if you don't like it, uh, bring the other half of the bottle, knock on your neighbor's door, leave it there and walk away and say, hey, I left you a half a bottle of wine. Uh, what do you think? Um, and it's, you know, wine is fun. Wine is not supposed to be scary or intimidating. It's supposed to be something that you can, uh, you want to try new ones. You want to experiment with it. Um, uh, and as far as what's going on with the wine industry in Israel, something really cool is also happening over there. And they're growing. So when I said there's about 350 total wineries, that number has been growing immensely every single year. They're starting to grow. They're starting to learn. They're starting to understand their land. Um, and they're building visitor centers. They're studying at UC Davis. This guy to become a master of wine, the amount of hours that he put into that is, is, is absolutely insane. Um, so just to see where the onion industry is going, uh, rosés. Uh, I'm sure everyone on this call has had a rosé this summer. Rosés, we have quadrupled our number of what we're bringing in from Israel. We're asking wineries to produce them at every single price point. Uh, dry rosés, fruity rosés, semi-rosés, everything. Just rosés are hot. Uh, it's easy drinking. It's uh, fun for the summer for all of us. Um, and the white wines also. Um, many people you know, say, I only drink red wines. I only drink red wines. Well, white wines are really starting to get good because people are realizing it's hot in Israel. They didn't really realize it was hot in Israel until a couple of years ago. Uh, so when it's hot, personally, I'm not drinking a Cabernet or a heavy red. I want something easy drinking. Um, and e- even something like this on a night like this, when it's just one glass or something, two glasses, something light, it's, it's a white wine for me most of the time too. Um, so uh, one more thing before you let you go, I was playing with this in my hand and I usually tell people what it was because I hold it during my Zooms, but it's kind of cool to look at. It's actually cork from a tree, uh, from the trees. And this is how they punch the cork you know, out of the, uh, out of the thing. So this is something I was playing with. I like to put it up. Well, I would be really remiss if I let everybody go without spending just a minute talking about some of what's going on in the Galilee. Um, you know, you've talked about how the wine industry is just really, really exploding in Israel in general. And, you know, obviously, um, the Galilee is an incredible sort of like breadbasket agricultural hub of Israel. And so obviously there's a lot of winemaking that's going on there. And Jaina, unsurprisingly, is also doing a lot there. So I just want to kind of mention a little bit um, about what, what JNF is doing in the North. Um, in general, one of the things that JNF has been doing is focusing on economic development in the North and the South of Israel. So that means, you know, building communities and everything that goes into making a community. And in the North, that whole initiative is called the Go North Initiative. So there are a variety of projects that are involved in that, but there are two in particular that I think are particularly relevant to what we've been talking about um, tonight. And so in the West, that's the, um, our, our partner there is Western Galilee Now. And so that's an organization that JNF is partnering with. And their whole mission is to support and connect all of these local businesses in the food and wine industry. So rather than just having like a little winery here and a little, you know, bakery here and a little restaurant here, they are, you know, putting together these whole food and wine tours, really supporting and connecting them to make an entire sort of food and wine community in the area. Um, so that's a really, really cool thing that's going on to support the local businesses. Um, and in Eastern Galilee, there's a new um, culinary institute, which is really, really exciting. It's a one of a kind culinary institution. It's crazy because Israel, in addition to being sort of a wine, you know, a burgeoning wine hub is also, as we know, obviously a really burgeoning food hub and they don't have a culinary institute there. So this new culinary institution will combine culinary and restaurant expertise with tourism and entrepreneurship. And, um, you know, it's it's based right there in the, in the Eastern Galilee, sort of in the heart of this mountainous region with microclimates and fertile lands and mountains and rivers. And it's really um, a beautiful, thriving agricultural region. So it's going to have, you know, a restaurant, a bakery, a brewery, organic farm, wine tasting, all of this stuff. And it will leverage, obviously, like the amazing sort of technology, business, entrepreneurship that Israel is known for, as well as, um, you know, an idea around inclusivity and that it will have a kosher kitchen, it will have um, all kinds of different cultural cuisine, whether it's Ethiopian, Moroccan, you know, 
Israeli cuisine is all cuisine, really, right? So um, bringing together cultures from around the world, um, halal, gluten-free, veganism, all of that. And it will bring tourists, jobs really build on um, supporting the local economy in the Eastern Galilee. So it's really um, amazing. And so I guess I just on that want to say that if developing the North speaks to you, to anyone on this call, and joining a task force is something that might be interesting to you, like this, this is a great way to get involved. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'm on the water task force. I work in water policy. So water and you know, that, that is sort of my chain of passion, but we have over 15 different task forces that focus on geographical regions like the Galilee or conceptual projects like water solutions. And it's a really, really in-depth way to get involved. So um, I, at the end, I'm going to announce a list of upcoming events, but I will also just say that on Sunday, Sunday, December 20th at 1 PM Eastern, 10 AM Pacific, we're hosting the chief executive officer of the new Galilee Culinary Institute. So he's going to be discussing the impact that it's having on the North. And so if this has piqued your interest at all, please mark your calendar for that. You'll be getting another, I'm sure, um, a, an email with more information about upcoming events. But I just wanted to let you know because it is germane to what we're talking about. It, it, it is. It's, it's so cool that we can, we can work our way through the land of Israel uh, and the JNF map at the same time. It's, it's kind of just like really cool. That, like I said, like it, it's not a joke that you can go visit a winery and go to a historical site, like literally right next to each other. And if you are really good and can convince the group that the winery itself is a historical site, you just did both. So, cause they are, a lot of these wineries actually have like ancient wine presses on them that are like 3,500 years old that they've been using, you know, so it, it is, they're all, um, and you also just, you'll see next to me here too, just to show you guys, point out more of my little uh, side things. I have all these different soil types and what's really cool, it's just to talk, oh, see if I think it zooms in and good. Uh, this one is a Terra Rosa from the Upper Galilee. We have some turf rocks from the Golan Heights. You know, we have uh, some sandy loose soil from the Negev. So it's really cool also to be able to see, to work our way through the map that we just did and to come through and to be able to walk the land of Israel in these different soil types is crazy. Like for this little tiny little country that's out there to have just in front of me, seven different soil types that are like the best soil types for growing grapes. That's crazy. That, it's, a, it's amazing. So um, I hope I taught you guys a little something about some of the Israeli wines tonight um, and you learned a little bit about it and you can pass something on to your friends, to your family, to your coworkers, because uh, everyone wants to talk wine, but no one ever really knows that they make Israeli wine. Uh, so make sure that they learn about it. And that it's good, right? I think kosher wine, this idea of kosher wine, it gets a bad rap. Like you see the, the Heckscher on your bottle and you're like, you know, kosher wine, bleh. But it's not, you know, that is a, a total misnomer um, completely. And I think this, certainly this event and the one that we did whenever that was, I don't know, time has no meaning, but the last one that we did really sort of opened my mind and my eyes to the idea that, you know, kosher wine isn't just like the Manischewitz that you have on the bottom shelf of your refrigerator. It's mm -hmm. like really good, excellent wine. I drink a lot of wine these days and um, the Israeli wine has been fantastic. I love it. So someone just asked what the quote was, uh, you can label wine, but you can't label people. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, working with great organizations like JNF that, you know, obviously everyone here has a special place in their heart for Israel and wants to support Israel and will willing to do anything for Israel. This is a really easy way to do it. And you get rewarded, Josh, I have you get a rewarded quickly. Yeah, I do have a question. I mean, I probably I was supposed to open this up to questions from the audience, but um, I've been asking a lot of questions. Does Israel have, you know how like some places, some regions are known for a particular kind of wine or a specific varietal, right? So like New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is a thing now. Mm -hmm. um, does Israel have a particular kind that it's sort of more known for or are they growing everything? I think they're growing a little bit of everything. Cab is king. Uh, mm -hmm. For being a 5,000 year old uh, wine region, they're still learning and still trying. Uh, like if you go ask a lot of these winemakers, their favorite thing to do is go just experiment and grow something new and try new stuff. Uh, and they have the power and the resources to be able to do it being in Israel. Um, but I don't think there'll be one specific grape. I think blends. Blends are probably a big thing that, that, that these guys are good at with incorporating, taking grapes from, because remember the country is so small, the winery is not necessarily where the, the vineyard is and they can take the grapes from all over the country and make the, the best blend that they can make. So. Cool. Cool. Question about that. 
Are there any unique winemaking styles that have come out of Israel? We know Israel is such a startup nation. Have they developed anything new in the wine world? Great question. And uh, yes, the, the, I, we we're talking a little bit about growing wine in the, this. It says sandy, loose soil in the middle of the Negev. So how do you grow wine in this sandy, loose soil, right? How do you do that? Uh, drip irrigation, which was founded in Israel, uh, definitely helped a lot. Uh, it's now used all over the world. Uh, I'm sure if uh, Doran's in Arizona and she went to the grocery store and there's that flower bed in front of the grocery store, they probably have drip irrigation in that little flower bed. Uh, oh, and it's just as do uh, a lot of our, our local agriculture here in Arizona uses drip irrigation. Correct. Um, and they use insulated tanks and they're still experimenting all the time with all this new technology of what they're doing. And there's a couple new grapes that actually was something cool also that they're actually found a lot of these old ancient grapes like uh, Dubuki and Mawawi and like all these ancient, ancient, ancient grapes that they found like little seedlings of like in old wine presses and they're bringing them back and seeing where they were and what they could do. And they're bringing some of these like really random weird grapes you've never ever heard of or can't even pronounce. And like, I have to think about it in my head three times before I say it, they're coming back. That's amazing. So Doran and I could ask questions all night, but I do want to encourage other people to unmute themselves and ask as well. Sam Heller, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, Daniel Rogoff used to do a great uh, wine guide uh, every year before he passed away. Is there a good uh, wine? Has there been a good replacement uh, for a guide for Israeli wine, especially with all the explosions in the past decade? It, it, it's a great question. And uh, I, I thank God I got to actually know Daniel towards the end of his life. And I would say that I would put Daniel on the list of single-handedly putting Israeli wine, not single-handedly, but putting Israeli wine on the map. And what he did was he opened up the door for Robert Parker, wine enthusiast, uh, decanter magazine, all these publications that were not just focused on Israel to start promoting Israel. And I think they realized that yeah, Daniel Rogov was specifically for the kosher world and for the Israeli wine world, but it got so big so quick that uh, I have it right there. No, the cover of Wine Spectator October of last year was Israel. Like, come on, that 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 that's that wouldn't happen years ago. Um, so, to answer your question, no one has replaced Daniel Rogov. No one will replace Daniel Rogov. Uh, there's a bunch of guys, you know, Adam Montefiore does a lot of stuff in the Jerusalem Post and Jerusalem newspapers, but for the most part, it's it's gotten to be such a real wine growing region that it outgrew a, a, a you know a reporter or a guy and now it's Janice Robinson and all the real guys writing these sto stories great question I have a question um so I know a lot of birthright trips will you know take you to a winery to do a wine tasting but I'm wondering if that's part of the culture in Israel that Israelis actually go to wineries to like Americans do you know to just kind of like hang out and drink wine yeah. I feel like I've never seen people there other than tourists. So 90% of the wine that's at these wineries that they're producing, they're consuming right in Israel. So Israelis parte hardy, okay? Like hardy, party, hardy. If you go to like Vitkin or a Flam or a, uh, like these small little boutique funky wineries that are amazing, Castel, Tula, uh, these guys have parties every Thursday, every Friday afternoon before Shabbat, like you wouldn't believe. Uh, majority, how most of these wineries stay alive is from sales through their wineries direct. Uh, you know, that's how they survive. That's how they make the most of their profits. That's how they encourage people to come. But yeah, those guys, it, it's becoming big in the last 25, 30 years. It's really become big. But when you guys are going also, it's, it's during the week at the three o'clock in the afternoon, probably. So uh, I hope the Israelis would be working. <laughs> they can drink later. So anyone else have, I mean, I can, I can ask questions all night, but I know that we have other people. I'm not the only person. This is not an individual one-on-one. -on -one. I'm, I'm going to challenge the Herman sisters. There's two of you, two brains combined. Any, any wine questions coming from the Hermans? Or what are you guys drinking these days? What are people's favorite wines or has, you know, are people, have everyone have never had a wine from Israel before tonight or not knew that Israel was making wine? I do have a question. Thank you, Steph, for putting me on the spot. What? I very much appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I, maybe this is ignorant of me and hopefully other people felt the same way, but I didn't know that um, corks were made from trees. 
Um, is that true? Yeah. I mean, it it's is a, true. You told us, it, but like. It's a live, living, breathing. It was a live, living, breathing thing. It's become uh, less because people are killing trees and we're trying not to do it anymore. And in my opinion, none of these wines are screw cap, but I love screw cap wine. I'm a big fan. I think that uh, there's no problem with it. Uh, if I was spending 200 bucks on a really high-end bottle of wine, would I want to cork in it? Yeah. But if I knew that the wine was going to be that much better because it had a screw cap on it, I would take it. Uh, Does it make a difference though, Josh? Because I remember when screw tops yes. like became a thing and you know, you know, it made you look down at the wine for the screw top. Oh. Does it make a difference having it corked? Yes. So cork is, like I said, it's a living, breathing thing. So it's letting little bits of air in it. I actually saw uh, this... I was just in my wine cellar, just getting the wines up for tonight, and I found a bottle of 1996, like some old Alsace Gewürz I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. Is this good? Is this not good? And I opened it, and it was unbelievable, right? The cork was perfect. It was light on its side. I just wanted to pop something just for fun, and it was unbelievable. It was perfect. Wow. Um, so the screw cap, what it does is the technology has come so far on that, that they're able to like, when you open to the bottom of a screw cap and you look at it, the inside, that little like plastic film on the inside, they can control how much it's opened or closed in the bottle. So how much, what percent of air is coming into it? Because a little air coming into the wine is okay. Too much, you'll kill everything, but it wants to keep it. So it's just the right amount of everything coming into it. And Listen, also, if you go to a restaurant, if anyone's ever been a bartender and you're working behind a, a bar and you want to open wine all night, it's much easier just to then go. I have another question for you. Go so um, last summer, or I guess maybe two summers ago, if it was 2019. So two summers ago, I went to Georgia, like the Republic of Georgia, and there they make a lot of their wine in clay barrels. Uh -huh. um, so do, because... I guess because they're close, their countries are close to each other. Um, does Israel do any of that within clay or yeah. is it really just an open? Great question. They actually use concrete and cement a little bit also. And the funny part is uh, a lot of the wineries, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, started ripping down them all. They're like, this is expensive. This is just taking up space. We want to go buy all these big ba oak barrels. And they started bringing in all these big oak barrels. And then Carmel Winery happens to be one of them. This guy named Yiftak Peretz, he's the winemaker at Carmel. And he decided to keep all these big things instead of ripping them all out. And like, he pats himself on the back when he tells the story. He's like, because you see, I just saved the company, blah, 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 amount of money because it's good. And they found out that it's real and it doesn't let enough air and it's perfect and it does this and it does everything. And yeah, they use a lot of that kind of stuff too. And for our last wine event, you had a rosé from Carmel Winery and it is my favorite rosé now that I, of all rosé that I've ever had, it was Appalachian rosé. It was Appalachian yeah. rosé and it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, it's Car Carmel's rich in history and uh, just a quick one on Carmel. Uh, Carmel was founded by the Rothschild family. So if there's any big wine drinkers out there, the Rothschild families are the most, one of, if not the most famous wine making family in the world. Uh, and the Rothschild family spent more money on their winery in Carmel than they did on their own winery in France. So. Speaking of rosé, can you talk a little bit more? Like, I, I love rosé, I'll admit it, I'm basic. Um, can you talk a little bit more about rosé? Like, for example, when I'm at a restaurant, sometimes I don't know how to or explain what kind of rosé I like. Cause I like the light one that's usually comes from Provence, like Whispering mm -hmm. Angel. Um, and I never you know say, how to- You would say Provence style. You would yeah. say Provence style when you like what it. What is Provence style? The Provence style is more of that, it's not as fruity, more of that like rose petal style, more of that lighter color, more, you know, when you look at it, you see more of that like salmon-y color. It's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the amount of, so when they make a rosé is, you know, most, all rosés, mo most, most rosés are made from red grapes, okay? So if you're drinking a, a rosé, it's maybe a Grenache or a Syrah or a Barbera or a Pinot Noir or a little bit, all those are red grapes. When you take a grape, a red grape, and you squeeze it, the juice that comes out of it is clear. It's, it's clear juice. It's like, it's yellow. It's like the color of this, like the color of a white wine. But if you were to take the grape skin of the Pinot Noir, and leave it on contact with that juice, that skin is what's turning the wine the color. The skin has all the color in it, all the tannins, all the flavor, all the everything is coming from the skin. 
So with a rosé, they take it, they take the skin on the contact with the juice, and then they throw the skin away really quick and the juice just sits there. And a normal red wine, if they were making a normal Pinot Noir, it would sit there longer and longer and longer and giving it more darker, darker color. But that one, they rip off so quickly that it's gone. So it's, it's, it's an easier drinking. It, if you like red, it's just fruity, it's fun, it's clean, it's fresh. There's no, I like rosé, there's no complexity to it. You're just thinking about it. There's a lot of complexity to it, but it's just easier drinking on the mind, you know? And so what's the other kind of rosé that's the darker one? That's would be more of that darker orange. Right, more of that berry, more of that strawberry. It would be a little bit heavier. Uh, you know, maybe that's more of a one that you're, you know, you're sitting back at the end of the night. Maybe you're sitting by the fire pit and you want to keep, you know, like that's that kind of one. Every, every wine has its own little situation. You know, you can find yourself drinking any situation, right? Uh, and <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. I said it, not you. Um, so, so when you find it, you just have to pair the right drink or right wine or right beer or whatever you're drinking with that moment, you know? That's why wine in a can is cool now. Like, who would have ever thought that wine in a can would be something, you know? Like, and that's one of the most popular categories there is. Where was wine in a can when we were all in college? That's my right. big question. That was Boone <laughs> Farm we were still drinking. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Anyone, anyone? Okay, I'll ask one more because we have like one more minute, but you talked about this a little bit, Josh, and I think we've, we've sort of been a layer over everything we've talked about, but I think there's like these old sort of rules about like you have to drink red wine with meat and you have to drink white wine with fish. So can you talk a little bit about pairing wine with different kinds of foods and desserts? And is it really just your taste, like kind of what you like with something or another thing, or are there actually like real guidelines that we should be paying attention to? I, I'm never the person to, that's going to push you. And the cool part about wine is you could do a hundred of these zooms and everyone's going to have their own little different thing, but I'm not a person to put rules on wine. Usually uh, I was the kid that was dipping my French fries in my milkshake when I was a kid. Like there's no rules. Like you do what you want to do. If you liked it, you liked it. If you didn't like it, you're not going to do it. So, um, you know, if you want to chill your, your red wines down a little bit because you like them a little bit colder, chill your white wines down. It's, it, it's okay. Uh, no rules. Know, there's, there's, listen, so what I would do normally, listen, if I'm having a steak dinner and I wanted a white wine, I would open a bottle of white wine. I would drink it while I'm cooking my steak. And with my steak, I'll have a red wine. Um, why? Because I think that the red wine maybe goes better with the meat, personally. But there's other people that, so to, to each their own, but definitely, you know, with spicier dishes, for example, this Kvirch demeanor that you're tasting, because it's got that little semi-sweetness to it, would be amazing with, with, sweet, with like a spicier food or like, you know, some, something with a little kick to it. So when you start realizing what you like, you can start pairing the food with what the wines that you like and see what everything will bring out of each other. Amazing. I, I like the no rules approach. That's my personal rule. Love it. All right, anyone, anyone? Okay, well, if there's nothing else, then I have um, just a couple of closing annou announcements. Thank you, Josh, so much for your time. I know it's late on the East Coast. So we really appreciate you joining us um, and everybody being being here to, wow, I've had a little bit too much wine. <laughs> um, I just want to say that this community is a really incredible place to build relationships with like-minded people. Um, as I'm hoping that you saw from tonight, I hope you learned something new and that you feel inspired to be a part of JNF. Um, I would really love for you to join me if you're not already in this special community to help make an impact in Israel by supporting JNF. Um, you will, I'm sure, get a follow-up email from this um, event tonight with more information about how you can get more involved. I really hope you do. I dropped my email address in the chat. So um, if I talked about any project or there's anything you want to know more about, really, you can always reach out to me. I love talking about JNF. I love talking about our work. I love talking about Israel. So um, please reach out to me. Um, please also be on the lookout for there's, there's a monthly newsletter that goes out that has more information, links to register to all the upcoming in, events in December. We're on social media at JNF Future. Um, and I'll just mention a couple of the um, events that are just coming up in the next couple of weeks, just to kind of put them on your radar. Um, the next event is Tuesday, this coming Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern and also at noon Pacific. Um, we're going to have an affiliate from Israel discussing um, JNF's work in fire and rescue. 
um, on December 11th at 5.30 in every time zone. We're having our monthly Jaina Future Virtual Shabbat. If you haven't joined us for one of those before, I really encourage you to. It's really nice. It's like 10 minutes, but it's a really, really nice way to welcome in Shabbat, like candles together. Um, so hopefully we'll see you there. Um, on December 15th, there's a Hanukkah event featuring a cooking demonstration, latkes soup ganiot, that you can cook along with, or I don't know, it's a little hard to do on Zooms, but you also get the recipes. And then um, also, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have an event on Sunday, December 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific with the Chief Executive Officer of the Galilee, Galilee Culinary Institute, um, which I'm sure will be amazing. If you haven't um, been to the website or you're not already following them on social media, maybe Steph or Melissa or another one of the professionals can drop the website for the Culinary Institute in the chat because it is an amazing website. Um, if you subscribe to their email, they send you recipes um, and it's just really beautiful. So I encourage you all to take a look and thank you for joining us. And that's my spiel. <laughs> Thanks so much, Josh. Really appreciate it. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you guys. <laughs>